How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter 6. Will You Pay the Price? The gods sell anything, and to everybody, at a fair price. Emerson. All desire knowledge, but no one is willing to pay the price. Juvenal. There is no royal path which leads to geometry. Euclid. There is no road to success but through a clear, strong purpose. A purpose underlies character, culture, position, attainment of whatever sort. T. T. Munger. Remember you have not a sinew whose law of strength is not action. You have not a faculty of body, mind, or soul whose law of improvement is not energy. E. B. Hall We have but what we make, and every good is locked by nature in a granite hand. Sheer labor must unclench. Oh, if I could thus put a dream on canvas, exclaimed an enthusiastic young artist, pointing to a most beautiful painting. Dream on canvas, growled the master. It is the ten thousand touches with the brush you must learn to put on canvas that make your dream. There is but one method of attaining excellence, said Sidney Smith, and that is hard labor. If only Milton's imagination could have conceived his visions, says Waters, his consummate industry alone could have carved the immortal lines which enshrined them. If only Newton's mind could reach out to the secrets of nature, even his genius could only do it by the homeliest toil. The works of Bacon are not Midsummer Night's dreams, but, like coral islands, they have risen from the depths of truth, and formed their broad surfaces above the ocean by the minutest accretions of persevering labor. The conceptions of Michelangelo would have perished like a knight's fantasy had not his industry given them permanence. Salvini contributes the following to the century as to his habits of study before he had established himself as a past master of tragedy. I imposed upon myself a new method of study. While I was busying myself with the part of Saul, I read and re-read the Bible so as to become impregnated with the appropriate sentiments, manners, and local color. When I took up Othello, I pored over the history of the Venetian Republic and that of the Moorish invasion of Spain. I studied the passions of the Moors, their art of war, their religious beliefs, nor did I overlook the romance of Giraldi Cintio in order the better to master that sublime character. I did not concern myself about a superficial study of the words, or of some point of scenic effect or of greater or less accentuation of certain phrases with a view to win passing applause. A vaster horizon opened out before me, an infinite sea on which my bark could navigate in security without fear of falling in with reefs. His method was not new, but he considered it so, and gives his opinion in quotation marks. He speaks of characters with which his name is not always associated by writers on the stage, but is correct, I think, in the main. Many years ago, a little boy entered Harrow School and was put in a class beyond his years, wherein all the other boys had the advantage of previous instruction. His master used to reprove his dullness, but all his efforts could not raise him from the lowest place in the class. The boy finally procured the elementary books which the other boys had studied. He devoted the hours of play and many of the hours of sleep to mastering the elementary principles of these books. 
this boy was soon at the head of his class and the pride of Harrow. The statue of that boy, Sir William Jones, stands today in St. Paul's Cathedral, for he lived to be the greatest Oriental scholar of Europe. "'What is the secret of success in business?' asked a friend of Cornelius Vanderbilt. "'Secret? There is no secret about it,' replied the Commodore. "'All you have to do is to attend to your business and go ahead. "'If you would adopt Vanderbilt's method, know your business, attend to it, "'and keep down expenses until your fortune is safe from business perils.' Work or starve is nature's motto, and it is written on the stars and the sod alike. Starve mentally, starve morally, starve physically. It is an inexorable law of nature that whatever is not used dies. Nothing for nothing is her maxim. If we are idle and shiftless by choice, we shall be nerveless and powerless by necessity. The mottos of great men often give us glimpses of the secret of their characters and success. Work, work, work was the motto of Sir Joshua Reynolds, David Wilkie, and scores of other men who have left their mark upon the world. Voltaire's motto was toujours au travail, always at work. Scott's maxim was never be doing nothing. Michelangelo was a wonderful worker. He even slept in his clothes, ready to spring to his work as soon as he awoke. He kept a block of marble in his bedroom that he might get up in the night and work when he could not sleep. His favorite device was an old man in a go-cart, with an hourglass upon it, bearing this inscription, Ancora imparo. Still I'm learning. Even after he was blind, he would ask to be wheeled into the Belvedere to examine the statues with his hands. Cobden used to say, I'm working like a horse without a moment to spare. It was said that Handel, the musician, did the work of a dozen men. Nothing ever daunted him. He feared neither ridicule nor defeat. Lord Palmerston worked like a slave, even in his old age. Being asked when he considered a man in his prime, he replied, Seventy-nine, that being his own age. Humboldt was one of the world's great workers. In summer he arose at four in the morning for thirty years. He used to say work was as much of a necessity as eating or sleeping. Sir Walter Scott was a phenomenal worker. He wrote the Waverley novels at the rate of twelve volumes a year. He averaged a volume every two months during his whole working life. What an example is this, to the young men of today, of the possibilities of an earnest life. Edmund Burke was one of the most prodigious workers that ever lived. George Stevenson used to work at mealtime, getting out loads of coal while the miners were at dinner, in order that he might earn a few extra shillings to buy a spelling-book and an arithmetic. His associates thought he was very foolish, and asked him what good it would do to learn to read and cipher. He told them he was determined to improve his mind, so he studied whenever he could snatch a minute before the engine's fire, and in every possible situation, until he had a good, practical, common-sense education. Garibaldi's father decided that Giuseppe should be a minister, because the boy was so sorry for a cricket which lost its leg. Samuel Morse's father concluded that his son would preach well, because he could not keep his head above water in a dangerous attempt to catch bait in the Mystic River. President Dwight told young Morse he would never make a painter, and hinted that he would never amount to much anyway if he did not study more. Although under the teaching of West and Alston in London, he became a tolerable portrait painter, he did not find his sphere until returning from England on a sailing vessel, 
he heard Professor Jackson explain an electrical experiment in Paris, when the thought of the telegraph flashed into his mind, and he found no rest until he flashed over the wire the first message, What hath God wrought? on the experimental line between Baltimore and Washington. This was May 24, 1844. William H. Vanderbilt was by far the wealthiest man in the world. Chauncey M. Depew estimated his fortune at two hundred millions. He left his eight children ten millions each, except Cornelius and William K., who had sixty-five millions each. Commodore Vanderbilt, his father, amassed a fortune of eighty millions of dollars in his own lifetime, and that too at a time when it was more difficult to make money than it is now. Mr. C. P. Huntington is a good example of a self-made man. His father was a Connecticut farmer. The farm was left to him, but he traded it off for a lot of clocks which he peddled in mining districts for gold dust and nuggets. He and Mark Hopkins formed a partnership and opened a hardware store in California. They united with Leyland Stanford in the construction of a railroad, and they all got rich rapidly. Mr. Huntington is one of the greatest railroad operators of the country. He always acted upon the principle that he would control the stock of any road in which he was interested. He is one of the most methodical men of all the millionaires of this country. He is very plain in his manner, strictly temperate, and very abstemious in his living. He said he never knew what it was to be tired. Russell Sage used to keep a grocery store in Troy, New York. He finally associated himself with Jay Gould, who used to be a constant borrower of money of him. Mr. Sage probably keeps more ready money on hand than any other millionaire. He can nearly always control ten millions or more at call. He has never speculated in stocks to any extent. Mr. Sage's word is as good as any bond. He has no taste for ordinary diversions except driving. Philip D. Armour, who has the appearance of a prosperous farmer, was born on a farm near Watertown, New Jersey. He became fired with a desire to see the, quote, boundless west, unquote. His mind seemed to run to hogs, and with a financial instinct, he made up his mind that there was a fortune in transporting the hogs from where they were so plenty to where there were so few of them and so many to eat them. He could now purchase every hog in the world and then have money left to buy a railroad or two. Mrs. Hetty Green is probably the richest woman in the world. Her fortune has grown from the little industry of her father in New Bedford, Massachusetts. She has raised the nine millions left her by her father, and nine millions left her by her aunt, to thirty millions. She is a woman of great ability and courage. She once took with her five millions of dollars of securities in a satchel on a streetcar to deposit with her banker on Wall Street. The probabilities are that billionaires will be as plentiful in the twentieth century as millionaires are today, through hard work, self-denial, rigid economy, method, accuracy, and strict temperance, for not one of the self-made millionaires are intemperate. John D. Rockefeller never tastes intoxicating liquor. He seems as unvarying in his method and system as the laws of the universe. Jay Gould did not use wine or intoxicating liquor of any kind. Mr. Huntington does not even drink coffee, while William Waldorf Astor merely takes a sip of wine for courtesy's sake. Not one of the leading millionaires uses tobacco, and not one of them is profane. Very rich men are almost always honest in their dealings, so far as their word is concerned. William Waldorf Astor, until recently, has been considered the richest man in the world, but John D. Rockefeller surpasses him now, it is said. 
The whole wealth of Croesus was little more than the income of this modern Croesus for one year. Mr. Rockefeller controls about eighty or ninety millions of capital stock in the Standard Oil Trust. The Standard Oil Company is one of the best managed corporations in the world. Two centuries and a quarter ago, a little tempest-tossed, weather-beaten bark, barely escaped from the jaws of the wild Atlantic, landed upon the bleakest shore of New England. From her deck disembarked a hundred and one careworn exiles. To the casual observer, no event could seem more insignificant. The contemptuous eye of the world scarcely deigned to notice it. Yet the famous vessel that bore Caesar in his fortunes carried but an ignoble freight compared with that of the Mayflower. Though landed by a treacherous pilot upon a barren and inhospitable coast, they sought neither richer fields nor a more congenial climate, but liberty and opportunity. A lady once asked Turner the secret of his great success. I have no secret, madam, but hard work. This is a secret that many never learn, and they don't succeed because they fail to learn it. Labor is the genius that changes the world from ugliness to beauty, and the great curse to a great blessing. See Balzac in his lonely garret, toiling, toiling, waiting, waiting amid poverty and hunger, but neither hunger, debt, poverty, nor discouragement could induce him to swerve a hair's breadth from his purpose. He could wait even while a world scoffed. Mankind is more indebted to industry than to ingenuity, says Addison. The gods set up their favors at a price, and industry is the purchaser. Rome was a mighty nation while industry led her people, but when her great conquests of wealth and slaves placed her citizens above work, that moment her glory began to fade, and vice and corruption, induced by idleness, doomed the proud city to an ignominious history. Even Cicero, Rome's great orator, said, All artisans are engaged in a disgraceful occupation. And Aristotle said, The best regulated states will not permit a mechanic to be a citizen, for it is impossible for one who lives the life of a mechanic or hired servant to practice a life of virtue. Some were born to be slaves. But fortunately there came a mightier than Rome, Cicero or Aristotle, whose magnificent life and example forever lifted the false ban from labor and redeemed it from disgrace. He gave dignity to the most menial service, and significance to labor. Christ did not say, Come unto me, all ye pleasure hunters, ye indolent, and ye lazy, but come all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. Columbus was a persistent and practical, as well as an intellectual hero. He went from one state to another, urging kings and emperors to undertake the first visiting of a world which his instructed spirit already discerned in the far-off seas. He first tried his own countrymen at Genoa, but found none ready to help him. He then went to Portugal, and submitted his project to John the Second, who laid it before his council. It was scouted as extravagant and chimerical. Nevertheless, the king endeavored to steal Columbus's idea. A fleet was sent north in the direction indicated by the navigator, but being frustrated by storms and winds, it returned to Lisbon after four days' voyaging. Columbus returned to Genoa, and again renewed his propositions to the Republic, but without success. Nothing discouraged him. The finding of the new world was the irrevocable object of his life. He went to Spain, and landed at the town of Palos, in Andalusia. 
he went, by chance, to a convent of Franciscans, knocked at the door, and asked for a little bread and water. The prior gratefully received the stranger, entertained him, and learned from him the story of his life. He encouraged him in his hopes, and furnished him with an admission to the court of Spain, then at Cordova. King Ferdinand received him graciously, but before coming to a decision, he desired to lay the project before a council of his wisest men at Salamanca. Columbus had to reply, not only to the scientific arguments laid before him, but to citations from the Bible. The Spanish clergy declared that the theory of the Antipodes was hostile to the faith. The earth, they said, was an immense, flat disk, and if there was a new earth beyond the ocean, then all men could not be descended from Adam. Columbus was considered a fool. Still bent on his idea, he wrote to the King of England, then to the King of France without effect. At last, in 1492, Columbus was introduced by Louis de saint Angel to Queen Isabella of Spain. The friends who accompanied him pleaded his cause with so much force and conviction that he at length persuaded the Queen to aid him. Lord Ellenborough was a great worker. He had a very hard time in getting a start at the bar, but was determined never to relax his industry until success came to him. When he was worked down to absolute exhaustion, he had this card which he kept constantly before his eyes, lest he might be tempted to relax his efforts. Quote, read or starve, unquote. Show me a man who has made fifty thousand dollars, and I will show you in that man an equivalent of energy, attention to detail, trustworthiness, punctuality, professional knowledge, good address, common sense, and other marketable qualities. The farmer respects his savings bank book not unnaturally, for it declares with all the solemnity of a sealed and stamped document that for a certain length of time he rose at six o'clock each morning to oversee his labors, that he patiently waited upon seasonable weather, that he understood buying and selling. To the medical man his fee serves as a medal to indicate that he was brave enough to face smallpox and other infectious diseases, and his self-respect is fostered thereby. The barrister's brief is marked with the price of his legal knowledge, of his eloquence, or of his brave endurance during a period of hope-deferred brieflessness. A rich man asked Howard Burnett to do a little thing for his album. Burnett complied and charged a thousand francs. "'But it took you only five minutes,' objected the rich man. "'Yes, but it took me thirty years to learn how to do it in five minutes.' "'I prepared that sermon,' said a young sprig of divinity, "'in half an hour, and preached it at once, and thought nothing of it. In that, said an older minister, your hearers are at one with you, for they also thought nothing of it. Virgil seems to have accomplished about four lines a week, but then they have lasted eighteen hundred years, and will last eighteen hundred more. Seven years Virgil is said to have expended in the composition of the Georgics, and they could all be printed in about seven columns of an ordinary newspaper. Tradition reports that he was in the habit of composing a few lines in the morning and spending the rest of the day in polishing them. Campbell used to say that if a poet made one good line a week, he did very well indeed. But Moore thought that if a poet did his duty, he could get a line done every day. What an army of young men enters the success contest every year as raw recruits! Many of them are country youths flocking to the cities to buy success. Their young ambitions have been excited by some book, or fired by the story of some signal success, 
and they dream of becoming Astors or Gerards, Stuarts or Wanamakers, Vanderbilts or Goulds, Lincolns or Garfields, until their innate energy impels them to try their own fortune in the magic metropolis. But what are you willing to pay for, quote, success, unquote, as you call it, young man? Do you realize what that word means in a great city in the nineteenth century, where men grow gray at thirty and die of old age at forty, where the race of life has become so intense that the runners are treading on the heels of those before them, and, quote, woe to him who stops to tie his shoestring, unquote. Do you know that only two or three out of every hundred will ever win permanent success, and only because they have kept everlastingly at it, and that the rest will sooner or later fail, and many die in poverty because they have given up the struggle? There are multitudes of men who never rely wholly upon themselves and achieve independence. They are like summer vines, which never grow even ligneous, but stretch out a thousand little hands to grasp the stronger shrubs, and if they cannot reach them, they lie disheveled in the grass, hoof-trodden and beaten of every storm. It will be found that the first real movement upward will not take place until, in a spirit of resolute self-denial, indolence so natural to almost everyone is mastered. Necessity is, usually, the spur that sets the sluggish energies in motion. Poverty, therefore, is often of inestimable value as an incentive to the best endeavors of which we are capable. End of chapter 6 Recording by David Martin